welcome. You're listening to The Real Truth About You. And this is a show where we help you to become the best you that you can be by discovering who the real you is and then living that to the full. I'm Will Sinclair. I'm your host for today. You can get more from our podcast at therealtruthaboutyou.com, therealtruthaboutyou.com. And I'm really excited today. I have Chris Ducas in the studio with me. And uh, we're just going to be talking about just about anything to do with anything to do with your walk or your journey or God. Uh, Chris is actually a seminarian in the Catholic Church, which means he's studying to be a priest. So welcome, Chris. Well, thanks, Will. It's just great to have you here. I'm so happy that you're here. And we're going to get a new perspective maybe on life or, or some things. And it may what we talk about may inspire other questions or whatever. So maybe first I can ask you, okay, for people who are not familiar with the Catholic Church, uh, mm -hmm. what is a priest and what is a seminarian? I thought it was some kind of pudding or something like that, but <laughs> what is it? Okay, well, a seminarian actually comes from the words, I think it's Latin for seminat, which means to be sent out to sow. So the idea is that a seminarian is somebody who's kind of sowing the seeds or getting ready to sow the seeds, which is in a way a reference almost to to what a priest does. Oh, now, I'm learning new stuff already, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. I, I'm always learning. So we're always on that journey. But yeah, no, um, I guess I'd look at a priest as, um, well, we talk about a priest having sort of a threefold ministry or three parts to the ministry of the priest. We'd say priest, prophet, and king. Now, the priestly part, we would look at in terms of worship and sacrifice. And for us as uh, Catholics, we'd look at the priest and say, where's the sacrifice or where's the worship? And for us, that's always linked to the Mass and to our celebration of the Eucharist, which is when the priest would take the bread and the wine and bless them. And we believe in our tradition that that bread and that wine become the body and blood of Christ. Can I hit back to a point for a second? Sure. While you're discussing, you're talking about the Mass, and I know some people don't know what a Mass is, and some people think, oh, is that sacrilegious thing we all wear hoods and things? No, <laughs> it's not relating back to the time of Jesus where he did that, the Last Supper where he gathered all his apostles or all his people together, his peeps. That's right. And, and he, he, what did he do then? Yeah. So if you look at, at Scripture, um, we would look and we would take that, that account of the Last Supper on what we look at is Holy Thursday, uh, the day where Jesus invites all of his disciples together in the upper room, and he takes bread and he breaks it and says, you know, this is my body given for you. And then he takes the wine and he says, you know, this is the cup of my blood, which, you know, is given for you, which is, you know, and he refers to it as a new covenant. And so what we would look at, and I think this is interesting for maybe for some of the people who have ever heard of the word testament. Now, the word mm. testament, I, I love this idea. I, I learned this from Dr. Scott Hahn, who, if any of you are interested in reading a uh, really good sort of Catholic theologian who can articulate really well the faith, Dr. Hahn is a, is a great person to read. Pretty well-known guy, isn't he? Yeah, he's really yep. well-known. He's actually a professor down in the States at a university called Steubenville uh, at Franciscan University. Um, so what Dr. Hahn talks about is he talks about this notion of of, of testament, which is the Greek word for covenant. So what he's saying is he would refer to, well, we have this Old Testament or Old Covenant that God makes, he makes with Abraham. And then we'd look and he would say, but there's also a new covenant. And the question that Dr. Hahn likes to ask, and generally most Catholics sort of struggle to kind of figure it out, is he says, well, where in the New Testament is, does God talk about a new covenant? Mm. Well, the only place that we see that is at the Last Supper, where Jesus takes the bread and the wine and and he establishes a new covenant with his people. And part of that covenant that Jesus says to his disciples is, do this in remembrance of me whenever you gather. And so as Catholics, we follow that command from Jesus that every time we gather, we re, uh, we would say it's, they use a fancy word called anamnesis. And mm. anamnesis is a, is a word that means a recalling, but it's more than just a recalling. It's an idea that you enter back into that event. It's like we're almost transported back to that very moment in the upper room where Jesus is with his disciples. And so we do this every time we gather, and that for us is what the Mass is, is it's a remembering of what Jesus commanded and asked us to do. So it's almost like it's happening right now. Exactly. That, like that's Jesus the idea. Jesus is right there with his, yeah. with his guys and his gals or whatever, and, 
is actually re- is actually happening right now. Exactly. That's why the idea of when the priest says, "This is my body. This is my mm. blood." What the what the church understands that to be is that the priest speaks in what we use a big fancy word. We say persona Christi, which means in the person of Jesus. The priest, by by virtue of his ordination, we believe his is conformed in a way, in a spiritual way, to become almost another, what we'd say is an altu or altus Christus, another Christ. And so when he says these words, he says them in the person of Jesus. Jesus, Mm. we believe that Jesus acts through our priests, which they are collaborators, we'd say, with the bishops. Our bishops, we would look at in the Catholic Church, the understanding of the bishop is the bishop is a successor to one of the apostles. He stands in the place of the apostle, and the bishop then confers or shares his authority with the priest to represent him, because a bishop can't be everywhere. He's one man. So I can hear the first question, wasn't there only like 13 or 12 apostles? You know, we're we're not only 12, and so, but there's like hundreds and hundreds of bishops, right? Yeah, we have thousands, actually. Thousands, okay. Yeah, we have thousands of bishops. But when you look, generally, a bishop would be responsible for a community probably between 120,000 people to 60,000 people. So, Mm. and then amongst, amongst, we would kind of classify those as dioceses, geographical locations where the bishop oversees, which is also another word that was used for the bishop or the episkopoi, which is a Greek word for overseer. So the bishop's role is to oversee the diocese, and he has priests that help him, because again, he's one man, he can't go everywhere, he can't be everywhere. Mm. So he has these assistants that help him. Um, so yes, we'd have that. And is that you? Would well, that be like the priest? Is that, the, yeah. is that as his assistants? Yeah, yeah. The, assistant, the bishop's assistants would be the priest, and another assistant that the bishop has is a deacon. Now, a deacon is, comes from the Greek word for service. And again, when we look back at, at the scriptures and the Acts of the Apostles, we see that in the early Christian communities, God's calling, calling you know, the community together to share, to live together. Well, what happens is, is that the apostles realize that, you know, they can, again, they can't be everywhere. They need additional help. Mm-hmm. So they call up seven men and they pray over these seven men and they ordain them deacons. And again, the idea of a deacon is to serve. In the church, so we have sort of this this three tier hierarchy within the church. We have deacons who help priests and help the laity. We have the priests who help the bishop, and the bishop whose ultimate responsibility is to help everyone in the mm-hmm. in the diocese, uh, which to which he is asked to govern. So, have you always been Catholic? Yeah, I have actually. I'm a cradle Catholic, but. I like to use the word, I'm a bit of a revert. Now, for some people, they might wonder, well, what, what the heck is a revert Catholic? Because I, I, I know, I, I, I saw you on the internet and YouTube, actually. You've got some videos on YouTube, and you actually say you question God's existence. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I, I, I would say I grew up Roman Catholic. Um, my parents are not practicing Catholics. My mom, um, actually, uh, her religious tradition would be the United Church, which is kind mm-hmm. of a, an amalgamation of Presbyterian, um, maybe Methodist, Wesleyan mm-hmm. um, here in Canada. Um, and then my dad's uh, religious tradition that he comes from is Roman Catholic, but Polish descent. So a lot of Poles, you know, culturally, certain countries just tend to be Roman Catholic. You could think of like the Philippines as a wonderful example, maybe Mexico. So certain countries, they just are. So in my family, we had these kind of two religious traditions. But when I was a child, my parents had no problem and just thought, okay, well, we'll just, you know, we're going to baptize them Roman Catholic. And their idea was, we'll send them to a Roman Catholic schools and they'll learn everything they need to know, which was a great <laughs> misnomer on their part. But, you know, they, they meant well. I didn't learn much of my faith when I went to uh, Roman, Ca- like Roman Catholic schools. Back then. Yeah. yeah. So um, it, was, it wasn't until much later that I learned my faith. And as a result of not really having a really good solid faith formation as a young child, it ultimately led me out of the church. I, I like most young, young people my age, um, just walked away. My faith wasn't important. I really didn't know it. So mm. it wasn't until I was in my 20s that I came back to the faith. Okay. So, you, you, so what did you, when you walked away kind of thing, what did you, it was a typical teenager well, getting into things or did you start focusing on careers or what did you do? Well, I guess I, I wasn't maybe the typical sort of, we'd, we'd use the term hellraiser um, <laughs> as a teen, but um, I certainly, um, I guess, how would I say it? In the back of my mind, 
I always knew kind of God was there. Now, I wouldn't be explicit about it. And I usually, I'd be kind of one of those people when, when times would get tough, I'd pray. But it'd be a very basic sort of, okay, God, here's my problem. I need your help. Help me. And mm-hmm. my, sort of, uh, my sort of bartering with God was more or less, you know, God, if you help me, I'll help others. Mm-hmm. And I had no idea how God would cash in on, on, that. on that promise. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's your promise. I'm going to take it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So did you find that praying actually helped you in your life? Like, did you, did you feel changes? Did you see things? Like some people say, oh, God never answers my prayers. I would say, um, I guess when I was younger, I could see results. I could certainly see results. I could see God was at, at work helping me. But I think I realized though too, it was a two-way street. I couldn't just pray and just, Waiting, like, as an example, if I was praying to do well on a test, I couldn't just, you know, the night before, okay, God, I'm ready for your help and not study or do anything. I, I needed to kind of collaborate or work with God. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd say later in my life, and at this point in, in my vocation and my discernment, I can say I've really seen God. Now, there have been times where I like to use it as kind of like that description. It's really common in the Catholic Church. We would talk about a dark night of the soul. Now, the dark night of the soul is is an experience where you feel like God is nowhere around and you're praying and you're asking, but God doesn't seem to answer. It's kind of like desert. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think of, um, of Mother Teresa. Now, now, some people might be aware of this, some might not, but Mother Teresa, for most of her vocation, as when she was working in India, had sort of a dry spell where she felt like she couldn't experience God, which mm. I think for some people, they wonder whether... You know, they sort of look at Mother Teresa as maybe a hypocrite and say, well, you know, here's a woman who was a charlatan. She pretended that, that, that you know, that she was all devout and everything. But I, I doubt that that was really the case. I think with Mother Teresa, she had such a powerful experience of Jesus, which led her to the slums of India to work in Calcutta with the poorest of the poor and with those who are dying who have nobody. And I think you'd have to have an experience of Jesus to be able to do that. Cause I just don't think you, you would, you, you could just do that on your own accord. Yeah. And so having had that powerful experience and then not to have that experience ever again would be so, so sort of, um, I guess I remember reading sort of a prayer that she had composed and it was, it was one of the saddest things I'd ever read. But at the same time though, too, you just sort of knew that here was a woman who had experienced Christ. Mm. And she knew what it was like to experience him. So that agony, imagine you're in love with somebody and you're, the person that you're in love with is taken away from you and you'll never see them again. But you know that, they, that they're alive. Mm. That agony just in your bones. And, and I think with Mother Teresa, when you read some of her writings, if you, which have been published um, now, you can really get a sense of that ag- agony and longing that she had for Jesus. Mm. I, I remember somebody saying uh, quite a while ago, he said, you can tell if God's behind something or if God's in it, because when you stop doing it, it continues. Mm. And I think that's pretty true of what she's done, isn't it? Her order is growing even more. And Yeah. Well, yeah. and now we're at least this year, actually in October, um, Pope Francis will be canonizing Mother Teresa as a saint. So mm. like you're saying, She's, she's still working. Now, I look at it as Catholics, what we'd understand it is, our understanding of the saints is that when somebody dies, I think a lot of us, a lot of us who, who have a religious belief, have the idea that when our loved ones die, they're not dead to us. They're still alive, in, but in a different way. Mm-hmm. And that those loved ones are still praying for us, still you know, trying to have some sort of an influence in our life. Mm-hmm. And for us as Catholics, that's what we believe our, with our saints. And, and Mother Teresa, especially, is somebody who I'm certain is, you know, praying for her sisters who are doing amazing work still with the poorest of the poor in, in countries all over the world with people that nobody else wants to work with or help. Mm-hmm. So the Catholics still, the Catholics believe then that they're still connected with the people who have died. Yeah, yeah. Right. We'd look at we look at it in scripture again. In scripture, and and unfortunately, I wish I could I could call to mind right away the passage. But that we talk about in, um, in scripture a cloud of witnesses, and what we understand that to be, uh, we understand that to be those of our family members and friends and relatives who have passed on, but who are united with us, 
who are praying for us. And these people are united with Christ. I think sometimes a, a beautiful analogy or, or um, example of this is if you've ever had the opportunity, if you haven't, I'd really encourage you to do it. Go into either an Orthodox church or an Eastern Rite Catholic, like Ukrainian Catholic, Greek Catholic, and look at their church. When you walk into their church, what you'll notice is you'll notice all of what they call icons. And icons are images of saints. And their churches mm-hmm. are just covered. It's almost like religious graffiti. And you look and you see I like all, that religious yeah. graffiti. You see all these saints and they're all looking at you. And the idea is, is that when you go into an Eastern Rite church, the idea is that you've just entered into heaven and this, you're united with the saints. And that's what the, the idea is, is to remind you that you're not alone in this world. Mm. We talk about in the church, we talk about um, the church militant uh, and the church triumphant. And, uh, and for Catholics, we look at it in three ways. Again, three is, seems to be that magical number. Mm-hmm. You know, we talk about the Trinity, we talk about God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. Well, in terms of, of you know, existence, we would say, we look at it in three ways. We look at it, those of us who have passed on, but who are in the process of purifying and being ready to be united with God. There's those of us who are alive at this very moment who are struggling through life, you know, to just to make the, our, the, mm-hmm. our daily ends meet, um, you know, just trying to be the best person we can be. Just and like we're sitting here. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. And then we talk about the church triumphant, those of us like Mother Teresa or this, our other great saints who are united with Christ, but they haven't forgotten us. They still pray and intercede for us because they know we need their prayers. Mm-hmm. One of the things I, I noticed you said when you're talking about prayer, right? you said you used to bargain with God is, is for people who pray, is it a bargain with God? Like, does God always expect something in return? Like I will only give you something if you give me this or, or does God just, is it like God loves you unconditionally, whether you pray or not? Like that's never going to stop. Yeah, we would, we, we understand it that, and I think the best example of this is at the, right at the beginning of the Bible where God in the creation story, everything that God creates, we say is good. So there's no such thing as an evil person created. God doesn't create evil. God creates Mm -hmm. only good things. And so, and the idea is that because God creates only good things, he wants to give them good things. Mm -hmm. And regardless of whether we pray or not, God still is giving us good things. And I, I love the scripture passage where it talks about, you know, even though, say, a father would give his son a scorpion, God would still, you know, give, give even more than, than the most wicked of parents to a child. And God is that loving father. We, we see it all through the Bible. We talk about the story of the prodigal son. The son yeah, who, I was just going to mention the prodigal yeah. son. Yeah, the we guy at, who took off to call his dad's money and, yeah, he said, and squandered it on everything. And, yeah, he said, you know, more or less what he's saying is, you know, I wish you were dead, is what right. he really says to his dad. He says, I wish you were dead so I could have my inheritance. Well, what his dad does? He says, you know what, I'll give you your inheritance. And what does he do? He goes and he squanders it in a life of, well, we, you know, some yep. of us speculate all sorts of ways that he might have spent it, mm-hmm. but he nonetheless kind of frivolously blew it all. Yeah, blew everything, <laughs> right? But he comes back, and instead of his dad saying, you know, I told you so, I knew you'd yeah. end up, you know, uh, his dad good for runs nothing. out to meet him. Yeah, he's waiting at the gate yep. every day. He goes out and he's looking to see, is he going to come home? And when he comes home, before he even has that chance to say, you know, I'm sorry, you know, I'm not worthy to be your son, the father hugs him. He calls to his servant. He says, you know, bring him that fine robe. Bring him a ring to put on his finger. Well, why a ring? Because his dad's giving him back authority in the family. And he also Mm. comes back barefoot. Now, this is something I don't know if many people know, but in ancient cultures, if you walked barefoot, you were a slave. And that reminds us that he was a slave to sin. But when he comes back to his father, his father says, bring him a pair of sandals because he's free again. He's come back into the family. And, you know, the beautiful sort of part of that story, too, is the older brother who, after hearing all this ruckus going on at the house, he comes back up and he says to the, one of the servants, well, what's going on? Well, the servant says, well, your brother's back and your father's slaughtered, you know, the fattened calf and they're having a big party. Come on up. <laughs> and he's really, really pissed off that his dad has done this because, you know, he's been this faithful son who's always done what dad's asked, you know, never wanted, you know, but his father comes out to him because he refuses to go in. Again, you see the love of the father who is so understanding. He goes out. He's always going out to people. That's our story. That's God for us. 
God's always coming up. He's finding us in the wilderness of our life, wherever we're at. And he's always explaining to us, if we're willing to listen, to really help us work through the challenges and difficulties of our life. Mm. And I think one of the things you just said there was about uh, party, <laughs> yeah. a celebration. And, and I think a lot of people think that uh, like Christianity or religion is a stuffy thing of rules, right? And, yeah. and obviously, I'm listening to you, and one of the things that really inspires me about listening to you talk is you talk with conviction and passion. So you can tell that God's a huge part of your life. It's not just it's not just something you've learned in a book, but it's something you've experienced and lived. Mm-hmm. What, what would happen if you took God out of your life? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I think I think I know what that looks like. I, I lived a life, you know, where God wasn't wasn't at the center of my life, and I can tell you, I seem to sort of float from one thing to another to another. Um, the story of my of my own vocation is that I sort of. If you watch the by vocation, you mean you're calling to become a priest. That's right. Yeah, God, yeah, yeah. I I would look at it as you know, and I think in, and most of us we we've had this experience in our life where when when we don't really have a sure foundation in our life, we flounder. We move from thing mm. to thing to thing, and we're always looking for. We're always trying to fulfill. Yeah, exactly. Right, that hole that's inside. Yeah, right. God. You know, we have kind of a God-sized hole in our heart. And we need to fill it. And I always think of uh, that passage by St. Augustine, which, you know, he says so like eloquently, our hearts are restless until they rest in God. And it is, it's very true. You won't find real peace or contentment. You'll always sort of feel a little bit on edge and you'll, you'll always sort of be wanting or, and I've, and I must say, I've, I've seen that with people. I've seen people who, who constantly, they're never satisfied. I don't know if, if many of your listeners can relate to that, but you know, we all have that experience where there's a restlessness. And I must say, I feel a great sense of contentment with what I'm doing right now. It mm. doesn't mean that life's perfect. Certainly not. It doesn't mean that I don't have, you know, good days and bad days, troubles. Well, for sure, you know, God didn't promise me that I'd have a smooth road ahead, you know, just because I believed in him. But he did promise me that he'd be with me along the journey. And I always think of that, that sort of that a lot of people might have might know of the footprints sort of mm-hmm. prayer, the idea that footprints in the sand. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're walking along the beach, and all of a sudden, you you turn and you only see one set of footprints, and you say to God, "Well, where the heck were you? You know, there were two sets there, and all of a sudden, for most of the journey, there was only one." And God turns and He says to you, "You know, it was I who carried you along the way because you couldn't do it yourself." Mm. And all of a sudden, you have that moment, sort of a, an aha moment or a eureka moment, where the light turns on and you realize. Yeah, Lord, you know, if it weren't for you, I wouldn't have made it through this really dark time in my life. Mm. So how do people hear God? Like we talk about hearing God, mm-hmm. right? We're talking about God is, is, I'm sure some people who are on their, on their a faith journey and they'll, they'll, they'll relate to and what you're saying might resonate with them when they're talking about God and their journey and I talk to God or God talks to me or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. But what about somebody who's starting and, and we say, hear God, is it this booming voice? This is God calling you, you know, God, God, God. Or, or is, how do you know, how do you know if God's talking or how do you know in your heart, you know, you're searching or you want yeah. something? How do you know God's connecting with you? Oh, I'd say, again, it's like people, places, things, and, you know, sometimes uh, one of the great sources is scripture itself. Now, I know there's some people who love to open the Bible and randomly open it, and they'll close their eyes, they'll randomly open and put their finger on a passage. And, Bible roulette. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. We'll spin the wheel and hope we get something great here. And sometimes, you know, God really can speak to you in that, and sometimes God leaves you just to sort of... Wondering. <laughs> yeah, you know. Wondering about, hmm, that's weird. <laughs> but I would say from my experience... I meant um, to sell my goat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would say from my experience, I've noticed that occasionally where I'll hear God in somebody, I'll hear a person will say something to me, and it, and it might be a moment of difficulty, trial, tribulation, or say even a moment of decision. So like all, all of a sudden something resonates with you. Yeah. 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 Somebody will say something and I'll be like, Wow, like that's meant for me. I know Dr. Wayne Dyer, um, he always says that he's not a Christian, but he's into God consciousness and Christ consciousness and stuff. He, he does mention, and I say this quite often, that when the student is ready, the teachers will appear, 
pray yes. that God will provide the teachers. And I think that's what you're talking about. Like all of a sudden you see something in a paper and it just jumps out to you or somebody says something or. That's right. You have to be ready because I, I think we, we can all relate mm. to this, you know, and, and probably we've had this experience on the other side where we're trying to advise somebody and trying to say, Hey, I think this is what you should do. And you know, they, they could, they disregard everything you say and they go and do what you said or what you're mm-hmm. recommending they shouldn't do. And again, it's because they were ready. And if we put ourselves in their shoes, we'll recognize, hopefully, we'll have, see that, yeah, we've done that before too, because we, like, we weren't ready. We weren't ready to hear that voice. Mm. And God prepares us. And sometimes God will let us go astray, like that story of the prodigal son, because if he didn't, we wouldn't learn. Uh, we wouldn't learn. We wouldn't, right. be, we wouldn't be ready to listen. And I think that comes back to that. People say, oh, you have to hit rock bottom sometimes. Right? Yeah. Sometimes you hear God along the journey but sometimes it's like you have to hit the bottom. You're told despair, and you yeah. feel like you've got nothing le- elf le- elf else left. <laughs> it's, yeah. You know. Well, I think what God's doing is he's he's kind of removing the pride because we're a lot of us mm. are very prideful people. We don't want to say that we're wrong. We don't want to admit that we need help. But those are two. Re- they're virtues. They're great virtues. It's amazing. You know, we always talk about men who won't ask for directions. You know, mm-hmm. and it's true to a certain degree. We don't. We're reluctant to do that. But, you know, when we do, it's amazing. It's amazing. You know, again, um, so that's one way that you can hear God. Sometimes, again, it can be an experience, something that happens to you, and you're changed. Mm. You witness something. You see something. And, again, it just leaves you. I think of just recently I was telling a story to some children about a little boy who saw a homeless man who said, I need a meal. And it changed him. It changed him in a way that he became proactive. And he was able to just make a huge difference. Just one example is he fed 175,000 people mm. because he was so moved by this, this example of this one man event. in need. Yeah. And we can have that. Sometimes we have that in our life where something happens and we're a changed person. So there's that. Another way that I look at it too is scripture. Like I say, sometimes we just need to sit and listen. Maybe we might take a passage and just read it and then pause and then read it again and pause and read it again. Or sometimes, too, it might be in a sermon or a homily that, that a priest or a pastor or somebody else is giving. And sometimes it can even be a lecture. Sometimes I know a lot of people like TED Talks. You know, sometimes I, I've, I've, myself, I've been inspired by some of the different TED Talks that I've heard mm-hmm. on different topics that have left me thinking, hey, w- one great one that I think of just recently was one on just simplifying your life. You know, if you simplify things, you know, it's amazing how much perspective you can get. And sometimes we need to just step back too. Sometimes mm. if there's something going on in our life, maybe we need to walk away from that for a while. You know, in the Catholic tradition, there's a great sort of historical tradition of, you know, stepping away, you know, going on retreat, getting away from a situation to think about it. Kind of retreating clearly. from life. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and that's the thing is in most communities, wherever you look, there's going to be a retreat center. So if you're finding you need that, you need to get away from something for a while. Mm. Think about that, you know, go on a retreat. It almost seems like through the Bible to, uh, when you're talking about retreating, like God seems to have led people into the wilderness. Yes. Right? Away from all the noise and the hustle and the bustle and, and life and busyness and cars and, you know, downtown traffic and stuff and, and leads them, whether that is a wilderness with trees and nature, which is ideal. Yeah. But, or the quietness of a bedroom, right? Mm-hmm. But it's almost like God seems to have said the most profound things in silence. Yes, yeah. Sometimes we talk about hearing God's voice in silence. And, you know, it almost seems like, almost like an oxymoron to think of, you know, God speaking in silence. Like, you know, like how does he do that? But it, it does happen. And it's mm. interesting. You know, some of the great spiritual masters, if you read them, they talk about this, you know, that they need it. I always think of, and a good example is like St. Francis of Assisi. Here's a man who I'm sure most people have heard of, and he's quite popular in a lot of different religious traditions, but here's a man who retreated. And yeah, granted, he was, you know, went out into nature, but one of the places that he loved to go to was a dark cave where he was mm. in total, utter darkness, and there was no sound, and he could hear the Lord speak to him. And sometimes we need those moments. And like you're saying, sometimes we can't maybe get away to a retreat center, but we can certainly close the door, turn the phone off, unplug the TV, unplug the radio, draw the blinds, and just sit. You can sit in darkness and silence 
and just hear and just allow the Lord. And then sometimes too, you know, we can use those breathing techniques to just breathe in, breathe out, just to calm ourselves. And then you can just use some, some people like to use a mantra. Mm-hmm. You can, a, a scripture passage or uh, maybe some sort of an affirmation. You know, there's, there's all sorts of ways that, that we can allow God to speak to us. And I know that's become very popular, actually. The, like in a lot of different traditions, like uh, whatever tradition, uh, Christian or religious or even, you know, whatever, there's people in spiritual walks, meditation is becoming very, very popular. The sitting and breathing, the mantra, the centering, the quietness. Mm-hmm. I noticed in, uh, I can't remember if it was, I think it was Elijah, with, when God led him into the desert and fed him and stuff, and then he led him off to this cave, and, and he was waiting to hear from God, and all of a sudden the thunder and the lightning came, but God wasn't there, and then the earthquake shook, and then I don't know what, whatever else came was loud and bang, bang, but God was, and he expected this thunderous God to come, and there was nothing, and then all of a sudden there was quiet, and there was a little whisper of yeah. air, and God was in the air. And spoke to him. Well, I, th- I always think, you know, God, God works in really strange and mysterious ways. And, and I love that scripture passage that says, you know, God's ways are not our ways. God's ways are way above ours. And, and that's the way God works. And sometimes God will take the smallest of things and just, uh, and just use it to speak to you in a way that's just, I, I just find it's moving. It's very like, and it's so significant, so powerful. And I think sometimes when we look in our lives, we can see that. We can see where God's humbled us. He's taken something that we wouldn't have expected. Use that to talk to us. Mm. Wow. I've noticed this whole conversation right from the beginning. It started with a kind of academic y feel, right? And and I notice it's turned into a very heart and spirit feel, right? And I don't know if you as a listener uh, can sense that, but hopefully hopefully you've stayed with us as long. And uh and I really feel that to really follow God is to experience God. You, you have this experience of God. That's what draws you in first, seems like. Do you find that? that the, it's that first experience. God gives you that experience. That's what draws you. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'd agree with you on that, Will. I, I think that what God does is it's almost like a little bit of a carrot he gives you. Yeah, yeah that's what I was thinking. I was trying to think, how do I say a carrot? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just said it. <laughs> yeah, he gives you that carrot to start you off on the journey, and um, and what he's gonna do is, he's he's gonna there's gonna be it's kind of like I look at it and maybe in terms of like a child learning to walk, you know, a parent will hold the child by the hands and help him walk for a little bit, but eventually the parent lets go and lets the child walk, and occasionally that child's gonna stumble, and again the parent's gonna come and pick that child right back up again mm-hmm. and help him walk, and there's gonna be this whole process. Until that child eventually learns to walk on their own. And, but the parent's always there. The parent, even though the child's walking, the parent never just totally leaves the room. They're always there. With them. And that's what God does. God wants us to learn to walk on our own, but he wants us to be in dialogue and conversation with him. That's mm. the important part. Right. Wow, that's amazing. And I can see God's call in your life. I can just sense it right here. If you could just be sitting here, I just sense that. Uh, that presence of God in you, Chris, and, and I'm just so grateful for it. And I want to thank you for coming and, and sharing with us. Your journey continues towards priesthood. This is July 2016. You've got how long to go yet? I still have another four years of four formation. Four years of oh, formation, right? So that's yeah. where they, they basically train, the Catholic Church is training you, teaching you, forming you as a, not only a human being, but as a, as a, pastorally to help people and so basically you're just going to be a helping loving machine well that's the idea you know (laughs) do the lord's work and help the lord's people yeah well that's awesome and so you've you've had that call in your life right Mm -hmm. what would you say to anybody else who feels like especially in the catholic church because this is a this tends to be a bit of a catholic conversation right now christian conversation god conversation whatever you want to call it what advice would you give to somebody if they feel some kind of desire to serve? And it, even though it may not be like to the priesthood or to go mm-hmm. be a nun, or what would you say to that person? Well, yeah, I, I'd say what we talk about is we talk about different types of vocation. Now, vocation is a call from, the, from God to do a particular sort of work in the world. Now, I always think of uh, a very famous cardinal, uh, Cardinal John Henry Newman, who, who sort of talks about that 
What God has done is he's given every person a special role, special type of job to do in this world, and only they can do it. And so I think what we need to do is we need to obviously be in dialogue with God. We have to ask God constantly, God, what is it that, I'm, that you're calling me to? Because God's not going to lead you astray. He's not going to tell you, I want you to do this, and then say, ha, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, exactly. You know, you fool, you should have done otherwise. Ha, ha, ha. No, <laughs> no, God's not going to be that way. He now, he might lead you in a direction. But for a particular purpose, like in my life, I'd say, I've done a variety of different things. And sometimes I, I might look back and I might have been tempted to say, well, oh, you know what a waste of time all that was. But when I look back, I can see that God was preparing me mm. for where he was leading me. To say hindsight, hindsight is twenty twenty vision. Eh? It, it always yeah. is. It always is. But in the moment, you're as blind as, I don't know, as a bat probably, you know. But I think that's the idea is that what God is going to do is he's going to lead you. But you got to be willing and, and you've got to trust. And, you know, it doesn't matter what, what you're going to do with your life, whether, like you say, whether you're going to become a priest, you're going to be married, you're mm-hmm. going to be single, you're going to, I don't know, become a missionary, become a pastor, become a motivational speaker. My gosh, just, the world is filled with different types of wonderful jobs that people can Podcast do. Podcast host. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Just like you, you know, yeah. God's calling us to do wonderful things, to help others in our life. I think that that should be the root of mm. what you do. And it should be something that you love. Don't do something just because, you know, it'll make you rich or famous. Because I think when we, when we look at the people who are rich and famous, I don't think I see a lot of happiness there. Mm-hmm. But the people who are doing what they love, regardless of whether they're making a, a bundle of money or none at all, you know what? They've got joy at the end of the day because they're being true to themselves and they're doing exactly what they feel God is asking them to do. And if you do that, you can't go wrong. What a great almost ending to the show, be true to yourself. Mm. And that's what this show is all about. And the real truth about you and discovering that. And sometimes we have to go through this journey of self-awareness and discovering who we are. We have to overcome lack of self-confidence and Mm -hmm. different areas like that. And that's all things that you've faced in your life, isn't it? Oh yeah. Um, Well, no, I could tell you, I probably, if you would have talked to me probably 15, 20 years ago, I certainly wouldn't have been as comfortable speaking in public as I am now. And it is, it's a process. It's a journey. You know, we start at one place, but it's amazing when we look back and we see all the growth that happens. And again, sometimes we just have to be willing to take that risk. And to mm-hmm. walk out a little bit farther, try something new. Don't be afraid to fall because we all fall. And you'd be surprised in a short amount of time how much growth can happen in your life if you just take that risk. So, you know, go ahead, do it. If, if that's what you feel, where God's calling you in your life. That's an awesome. You got any last words, last wrap up, or was that a good one for you? I think that that was as, probably as good yeah. as it's going to get. That was a good wrap up. Yep. So Chris Jukas. Thank you so much for coming in today. I've just had a pleasure just being able to be with in your presence. And you've been listening to The Real Truth About You. And you can get more uh, downloads uh, of this podcast from therealtruthaboutyou.com. We also have... Uh, we also have resources up on our website and, uh, you know, and if you want to have a question for Chris, you can add it to the comments under this episode and thanks for listening. And remember, um, share this with other people because other people need to hear. If you know of somebody else that needs to hear this message, then share. I'm sure Chris would love that. And he shared his life with you by coming on this podcast. So do us a favor and share this message with somebody else. Because when you help somebody else, you're also helping yourself. And remember to go to therealtruthaboutyou.com. Love to touch base with you if you've got anything you would like to hear. And But most of all, remember that you are loved, you are special, and God loves you beyond compare. And it's the first time I've said that to you on this podcast, but it's true. And remember, have an awesome, awesome day because you rock. You rock.